my godless childhood. I've been watching quite a few videos lately by people who have lately rejected their Christian upbringing, rejected their Christian faith and belief system. They were usually brought up in a household where they were taught about God, taught about the devil, taught about hell, and told that if they did the wrong thing, they would go to hell. They were basically brought up with a bunch of horror stories that this big man, God, was watching over them. If they did anything wrong, they'd be sent to hell. And I really understand their struggle to break out of that and admire their strength in breaking out of those childhood belief systems. But in looking at them, I realized how completely different my own situation has been through life. When I was growing up in the UK, I was born in 1957, God was never discussed in our household, nothing about God. God was never mentioned as far as I can recall. I suppose being the 1950s, 1960s, I suppose my parents believed in God at some level. It was just part of the ethos of society, but it made no impact upon them in any way as far as I can tell. They never talked about it. It made no difference to their lives. It was just like the air they breathed completely indifferent to it really, gave no thought to it at all. So I wasn't bombarded with these ideas of God and hell and Satan and damnation and so on. I was of course baptised in the church when I was an infant, that was also just part of the tradition, it meant very little to them or to me. And I do recall at school every year going to something called the harvest festival in some church somewhere when there were lots of tin goods and fruit and vegetables all up at the altar i had no idea what was going on it was just a day out of school for me so i didn't have in any way a religious upbringing the issue of god didn't come into our conversation any more than the history of the peloponnese wars did when i did eventually turned to Christianity when I became a Christian late in my teenage years, my approach to that was largely intellectual. I had at times been prone to what I would describe as mystical experiences. I don't know whether you've experienced this yourself, but I can remember, for instance, when I was at university, so I would have been maybe 19, 20 years old, coming home from lectures on the train and it was fairly late at night and walking home from the train towards home and it would be a beautiful clear Adelaide night, billions of stars shining in the heavens and I would just get this amazing sense of wonder and a sense of kind of belonging of myself wafting out there into this great beyond. Yeah, it's all pretty corny, I understand that, but these were real experiences for me at the time. And uh, in my reading, I'd encountered these experiences in other people as well. For example, I'd read most of uh, D.H. Lawrence's books by that time in my life. And there's a deep mystical strand running through D.H. Lawrence's writing, particularly associated with the landscape. I don't think D.H. Lawrence thought of God as some being up there, but very much as part of this landscape. These were mystical experiences. And I remember also, for instance, reading The Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky. And in that book, there's a chapter where Jesus returns to earth and is arrested by this bishop. And the bishop interrogated him. Why have you come back? You'll ruin everything, basically, is what he was saying. And basically, Jesus remained silent throughout the whole interview. But this brought to my mind these issues. What were these experiences I was having about? What was this Jesus bloke about? So I began an intellectual exploration. One of the things that I did in those days was that I began to read the Gospels. Now, I wasn't reading these with any religious predisposition. I wasn't looking for inspiration or teaching in these books. I was reading them to try and understand them. What is this about? What is Jesus saying? What, is this, what does this all mean? Eventually, I came to a position where I, I thought I understood in an intellectual way what the message was, that we were broken human beings, that we couldn't escape from our own brokenness, that we needed some 
help from beyond and I thought maybe these mystical experiences which felt as though they were lifting me out of myself, lifting me up somewhere, maybe these were part of this kind of healing salvation process. My journey to Christianity then was a fairly intellectual journey and at that time I was reading people like C.S. Lewis. His journey to Christianity also it occurred later in life and via an intellectual path. This was not an emotional journey, it was an intellectual exploration that took me to adopt a certain position, as it was for C.S. Lewis. Now already, before I began to describe myself as a Christian, I understood th things about the Big Bang, about evolution and so on, and I in no way felt that I had to abandon those scientific beliefs in order to become a Christian, in order to believe what I thought the Christian teaching was telling me. I did briefly go through a phase when I became part of what was called the charismatic movement. Now, this movement was heavily influenced by the evangelical Pentecostal churches and it was brought into the mainstream churches by a small group of people anyway in an effort to kind of revitalize, reinvigorate and renew the Anglican church which was, let's face it, a fairly old and crusty institution and it probably needed shaking up. Unfortunately, it brought, brought with it all these accretions, things like speaking in tongues and casting out demons and so on. And for a brief phase, I belonged to this movement. But once I entered theological college, then my intellect was again stimulated. I don't think I ever went so far as to believe that Adam and Eve were real or that uh, the flood was real, that Noah was real, any of that. But it certainly did tend to numb the intellect. But once I entered theological college, I felt free to think again and think I did. I loved reading the theology and philosophy that theological study involved and also the historical studies that we did. When we read the Bible in theological college, we weren't reading it in a devotional way. We weren't reading it to be inspired. We were reading to understand it in its historical and literary context. At no point in this teaching was I expected to believe that Adam and Eve actually existed, that the flood actually happened. I wasn't even required to believe that Jesus was born of a virgin or that he literally rose from the dead. I wasn't required to believe in a literal hell or even a literal heaven for that matter. I was quite free to interpret these things in a kind of mythological framework, which by and large I did. And later, when I was preaching about these things or teaching about the, these things, I was always very careful not to present them as if they were historical stories. I presented them as if they were stories which were meant to teach us something. For example, that, Jesus, that God immersed himself in the world so that he could share our experience and raise us out of it. Those kinds of things. That was my understanding. After a time, of course, I realized, again intellectually, that the Christian teachings weren't actually explaining me or the world at all and in some ways they were getting in the way of understanding myself and that what Christianity claimed to do, it didn't, at least not for me. So my drift away from the Anglican Church was also an intellectual exercise by and large. It wasn't because I was suddenly appalled by the hypocrisy of the Church or anything like that. I understand when people are and uh, I can see it myself and really came to see it later more clearly still. But at the time for me, it wasn't about those things. It wasn't a rejection of the church on moral grounds. It was a rejection of the church and the Christian teaching on intellectual grounds. And it remains that to this day. It wasn't that difficult for me to return to an earlier intellectual position, obviously somewhat modified by what I'd been through in those intervening years. But it wasn't as if I had great emotional difficulty casting off this layer of belief or understanding that I'd accrued over those years. I wasn't, in a sense, emotionally attached to it. I suppose in many ways, to those who call themselves, or many of those who call themselves Christians today, they wouldn't consider me to have been a Christian at all. And probably in their terminology, they're absolutely correct. I never gave my heart to Jesus. In fact, the idea was and is abhorrent to me. It's just silliness.
The only thing I really did lose was the community of which I'd become a part, and that, of course, is always a struggle, and I suspect it's why a lot of people remain long after they've lost their actual beliefs in the Christian teaching. But it wasn't an enormous struggle for me, except in terms of losing the community and also, of course, losing a livelihood because I didn't really have any qualifications to do anything else. And that's another story again. But I'm grateful that I wasn't burdened with these childhood teachings that I had to somehow drag myself away from, pull myself out from. I know the impact of what you learn as a child can be enormous, and to try and break free of that can be a lifelong process. I'm grateful that I didn't have that to deal with. I'm very grateful, in fact, that when it came to God in my household as a child, there was basically complete indifference. Thank goodness.